Hey, good morning. morning. Hey, if you're new, I'm Charlie, uh, the lead pastor here. Really glad you're worshiping us, whether you're online or in the room. Really glad that you are here. And it was my birthday earlier this week, and my wife asked me what I wanted. And I said, you know, when the hogs win, I like to wear hog merch. And sometimes some of the shirts I wear, you're like, you don't feel like it kind of rises to the level of uh, stage worthy. So I need a stage worthy hog shirt. So we got this going here today, which is really exciting right here. And I like my shoes too. I, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I, I like these shoes. This, this, this is celebratory gear we got going here. Hey, um, if you've been around, you probably know over the last few weeks, we've been trying to raise about $80,000 for our kids' ministry, for some worship stuff, for some missions. And we're at 70 right now, which is really great. I mean, we're, we're definitely on the downhill side right now. Just want to give you an update and thank you for that. We're about to start doing some stuff with our and our kids and almost all the worship equipment stuff that we need is almost all here. So we're about to, we're about to finally uh, be past that. So it's going to be great. Um, who's looking forward to Thanksgiving? Really? Who's apprehensive? You know, nobody? No, no see, if we were talking like in person, like just, just me and you, right? We'd be like, eh, a little bit. Because most people is like, you know... You kind of get together, you have some of these extended family gatherings, and you know, it just, you just, you just kind of get a little nervous, because there's somebody, there's somebody that you're, that's kind of a bit of a wild card. And you may be thinking, and this may be why you're all excited about it, there's a wild card in your family, it's like, no man, everybody in my family is totally cool, and if that's what you think, it's, it's you. It's you, you're the one, you're the one everybody else is a little apprehensive about, you know. I mean, you got, you know, you got, you, got, you, got, you know, people with the stereotypes, you got Overly political aunt, drunk uncle, inappropriate joke-telling grandparents. I mean, you just, and, and, the, and these things, they happen. And, and, and lots of times you get into these situations, you can just be, on, you just be nervous about it. And then the inevitable thing happens at the holiday gathering, right? And it's uncomfortable. And then when it's over, you're driving away, and I guess I guess I'm really I'm saying you. I'm and you know it's all. I mean, maybe it's me. I maybe it's just me. Like you're driving away, and you're just kind of like, can you believe they said that? Can you believe they did that? Which in fact is what they always do. It's who they are. They do it every year. It happens every time. Every time we get together, this is what happens. But that's what we say. Can you believe that? I'm like, yeah, actually, I can believe it. That is that is who they are. And I think we get that way sometimes with people where really it's an expectations problem on our end. People are who they are and it's frustrating, but then we act surprised when they are just being who they are. And we burn and we waste a lot of energy being upset by people for just being themselves. And it's not that it's not, that suddenly it should be appropriate. It's not appropriate, but it's just who they are. And honestly, the real work is I've got to figure out how to be healthy, how to be godly, how to be okay, how to be at peace in a situation that I know is going to be somewhat chaotic. And it's honestly, it's not just, it's not just, it's not just family, it's friends, it's work situations. It's the world in general. I mean, there are just things out there in the world where things happen and it seems like they always have. And, and it's just like, and, and, and it frustrates us. And, and like, we can't understand. I don't understand why they are like that. I don't understand why people do that. And we, and we get really, really frustrated. And we can't, we can't figure out how to live above it. And if you've been with us over this last few weeks, we are now wrapping up a, a series kind of looking at several stories in the book of Daniel. And what we have here in the book of Daniel is really kind of story after story of how to live for God, let's just say, in a chaotic, ungodly situation. And kind of for the history of it, we've got, uh, there's one kingdom of Israel got split in two. The northern kingdom gets conquered. The southern kingdom remains for a little bit. They ultimately get conquered by Babylon. It's pretty bloody. It's pretty nasty. Some of them, a lot of them are taken into exile and are kind of being taken through a a re-education camp of sorts where they're trying to get them to kind of give up everything about their identity and become Babylonians. And we're seeing this over the course of the book of Daniel. And and then very often Daniel or his friends or Daniel and his friends being put in situations where they live in a culture that is very hostile towards them being people who follow God. 
and watching them and the way that they learn how to kind of rise and live above it. And so we're now in Daniel chapter 6, and we're on our third king so far. Started with Nebuchadnezzar, and then one of his successors, a guy named Belshazzar. And now they have been conquered by the Persians and the Medes. And now we have King Darius, for the first, we were introduced to him in Daniel chapter 6. And probably the most well-known story from the book of Daniel will be Daniel in the lion's den. So we'll start here at the beginning, Daniel chapter 6, <coughs> starting in verse 3. <clears throat> now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by these exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So we've got this new kingdom, new administration, and he's kind of got these, kind of these regional governors who kind of oversee small groups of people, and these administrators who oversee these, they're called satraps, oversee all of them, and then there's the king. And um, Daniel's doing such a good job in kind of his administration of all of this that the king is thinking, I'm just going to put him in charge. Verse 4. At this, the other administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God." So the king is about to put him in charge of everything. He's about to be the second most powerful person in this kingdom. And the other people get incredibly jealous and say, man, we got to do something about him. He's about to become more powerful than us. And they look and they can't find anything wrong with him. He's not lazy. He's not uh, corrupt. He's not evil. There's nothing. He's doing everything right. But that doesn't make them think, well, I mean, he's obviously he's a great guy. We should probably just let this go. They're all the opposite. They're like, we got to find something. I bet we can find something where the values that he has and the way that he worships God can com- go conflict with the values of our kingdom, and we can trap him that way. And so we've got a picture here of Daniel who is described in this story as doing everything right. And there is a plot against him. Spoiler alert, the story is called Daniel in the Lion's Den, right? You know, we probably know where this is going, right? There's a plot against him that ultimately is going to put his, enti- his life literally at risk. He's about to be sentenced to be executed, and he's doing everything right. And so we'll say that this way, we'll describe it this way. The world is unjust. We want to live in a world we want to live in a world where if you do, the good, you do a good thing, you get rewarded, and people who do bad things always get punished. We want to live in that world, but we actually live in this one, where that's, where that's not always true. And depending on how you grew up, what kind of dad you had, most of us probably had this dad, you know, one sibling gets something, you don't get something. You're like, that's not fair. And what does dad say? Life's not fair which his dad said to him and his dad said to him and you hated it and he hated it and you're passing it on now because it just seems like something you want to agitate your kids by saying. But it's true, but fair is different than just. Fair is everybody should get the same thing. And we know life's not that way. But we want to imagine sometimes that it's just though. Even though it may not be fair, everybody gets the same. We want it to be just where, you know, It is the good people that get rewarded and it's the bad people that get punished. But let's just be honest, that's not the world we live in. I mean, corruption, power, wealth, influence. Would you you say that you look in the world, like the people with the most power and the most wealth are the best of us? And the people who have the least power and the least influence and the least money are the worst of us? No, we would not say that. The world's not just. And there's ways that we're trying to make it so. And Barack Obama, when he was president, used to talk like this, that the arc of history is long and it bends towards justice. We're making it more just. If you look, if you take the long view, which is an idea he got from Martin Luther King, an idea he got from uh, from Gandhi. And if you squint and look at it just like this, there's certainly some areas when you say, I guess the world is getting more, it's getting better. I, I think we're raising the floor of how bad things used to be 
but the, the, the injustice of the gap. I mean, it doesn't really matter what your political persuasion is. There's probably not a whole lot of it. No, 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 absolutely. People who have the most power are definitely the best of us. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, it's like there's, there's an injustice to it, to this world that we live in. That's not all that's going on here. Let's continue here. So they figure, they figure out. They figure out a way to trap in verse 7. <clears throat> the royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. So here's an idea. Let's just pass it off. Let's call it king month. And, and we're only going to worship the king. You can't pray. You can't worship. You can't do anything. If you're going to do anything religious, it has to be to honor only the king. No gods, nothing, just the king. And, you know, the king, he's kind of delegated all his powers to these guys. He's really not doing anything except just kind of, you know, unjust thing. I just live off his wealth and his power and his influence. He's not really doing any work. Again, pointing to the injustice of certainly the world that Daniel lived in. He's like, that's a great idea. We should totally have worship the king month. That sounds great. And so without really thinking at all much about the consequences of it, he, he signs that law. And so now in this, this kingdom, it is the law of the land that if you worship anyone other than the king, you will be executed. That is now the law. So not only was the, da- the world that Daniel lived in, was it unjust, it was also the world was un- is ungodly. And that's not any different for us either. The world is unjust, the world is ungodly. There are people, and when you say it out loud, like you're sitting here on a stage, you've got the, you got the, the heart and attention of people, and you're trying to say things, and you want the things that come out of your mouth to be profound, and they come out, and they're not really but the way that we act, you still have to say it, it seems like, the way we act sometimes. You know, there are non-Christians out there in the world, people who aren't Christians, and they don't live according to Christian values. They're people who aren't religious at all, and they don't live by any religious code at all. And the lives that they live and the issues and the things that they advocate for do not align themselves with what God says they should do. That is out there. That is the world. In fact, the overwhelming majority of people in the world are not Christians and do not follow um, the ideals and the, mor- the moral code that God has called his people to follow. That is reality. And I think that seems to cause us a lot of stress sometimes. It seems to cause a lot of problems, a lot of a lot of uncertainty and frustration for us is like, how, why, is the world, why is the world like this? Why are people like this? Why do they do this? Why are they advocating for this? Why do they think this is okay when it's not? And it causes us a lot of stress for people to be who they are. When non-Christians think, behave, act, and advocate for things that are non-Christian values rather than for Christian ones. It angers us. It upsets us. It just, it sets us on edge. Now, I don't know where you grew up. I don't know how often you went to church. I don't know when I think about pastors, what you think of, like kind of, kind of what your predominant image is. But the way that I grew up, if I was listening to a sermon and the first two points of said sermon were in order, the world is unjust and the world is ungodly. We're about to get a very, very angry message. He's about to, he about, about, somebody about to go off. And we're going to talk about how dare they and the world is corrupt and the judgment of God is coming. And I'm so glad you're in this room where only good people are and we're good and they're bad. Let's celebrate our awesomeness. Right? And, 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 and we just generate all of this anger out there and kind of praise ourselves for not being out there. And so Daniel finds himself in a situation way worse than any situation that probably those of us who, who, live, who live right now can imagine. 
that have ever really experienced. We've experienced measures of ungodliness. We've experienced measures of unjust. But it is very unlikely that anybody here in this room has ever been in a place where it was illegal to even practice your belief in God and your worship of God. Is it illegal to even do that privately? But that's where Daniel is. What do we think he's going to do here? Verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had, been pu- decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Well, they passed the law, making it illegal for me to pray. And what does he do? He quietly, calmly goes to his house, goes to the place where he prays and prays to God like he always has. No fighting, no arguments, no no screaming, no laments. And it's not like Daniel didn't have options. I mean, he had options. He is potentially, he is on path to becoming the second most powerful person in this entire kingdom. He had the king's ear as much or as much as anyone did. And I'm sure, I'm sure, that there are parts of things that Daniel did, both as this, as this idea was being thrown around. It probably wasn't happening in secret. It wasn't like the powerful people were over here and Daniel's over here by himself. I mean, Daniel's being married. I'm sure he is trying. I'm sure he's trying. I mean, guys, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, shouldn't do this. It's not, a good, it's not a good idea. But none of that's in here. None of it's in here. This is the only response that is put, that God put in this story for us. Because this story exists at a time when God's people are being ruled by ungodly people. And, and it, as the original readers, the people who are experiencing this, they're about to figure out, like for generations, for hundreds of years, they are, about to, they are going to be an oppressed, captured people. They'll get to go back to their homes but they will always be ruled by another kingdom for generations to come. And so God puts this story and all of these stories here in the book of Daniel, kind of what it was like at first for them to kind of live under an oppressive regime that that is trying to pull them away from God. And now you're going to have to live like this for hundreds of years, all the way to the New Testament, where Jesus is trying to talk about some of these same things as they're living under the rule of the Romans. And Jesus is trying to tell him, hey, here here are the principles. And the only thing that we get, the only reaction we get from Daniel is here. And and, and, And so you ask this question, how should we respond? How should we respond, right? How should we respond? What should we do? We look at Daniel. We look at how the story has, has continually played itself out over the last several chapters. It's kind of very similar things continue to happen. We look at it in the life of Jesus and the thing that Jesus was saying to his followers and the people who, like, who lived under these oppressive, ungodly, unjust regimes, what is it? And I will say it this way. Don't fight. Don't be a fighter. Don't be angry. Follow Jesus with your whole heart. We don't get any hostility from him. You don't get any anger from him. And it's interesting, again, how this story continues to repeat. Um, they were trying to make Daniel and his friends eat unclean food. He said, we're not going to do that. He never looked at anybody and said, you shouldn't either. And how dare you even have this? How dare you even cook this food at all? Don't you know? God doesn't like that. Hey, we're going to build this idol, this golden idol, and everybody has to bow down to it. No, we're not going to do that. Never. What's wrong with you, dude? Why would you even build this? And why are all of you bowing down? Just, no, I'm, we're not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, we're not, we're not going to do that. There's no, there's no anger. There's no hostility. There's just Daniel very calmly and peacefully being the man that God has called him to be. Which gives him an incredible opportunity to model godliness to the people, but also that he's always pointing them to God. I can't do this. I have to follow God. I have to. And so by his words and by his actions, 
he is demonstrating to this hostile environment that he is devoted to God. And I think, I really do, I, I believe in the same way as Daniel, we have a lot of options. Maybe in some ways we have, we have, we have more. We certainly have different ones than he did. We're a lot freer than he is in some ways. We don't have as much influence and power at the highest levels. We have lots of options of how to respond when we see the world behaving in a way that is in opposition to who God is, that is in opposition to God's values. We have a lot of options, and I think we often we fight. We like to fight. We want to fight because I think we, we, we're battling because of this illusion that somehow I can fight and I can have control. And if I can exhibit my control, I can make the world something that it's not. I can make the people around me someone they're not. And if I fight and I'm angry enough, I'm hostile enough, I'm clever enough, then I can get people to not be who they are. I can do it. And also, I'm afraid I'm fighting for my own comfort. The illusion of control and comfort drives me. And I lash out in all sorts of ways. And meanwhile, our world is full of people who desperately need Jesus. And they're watching us. They're watching you. They're watching each one of us, not because they don't like us, not because they want you to fail, but because there is a hunger in this world because everybody, you don't have to be a Christian to believe and to understand that there is an immorality and an injustice in the world that we live in. You're not going to get a lot of argument about that. But there is a craving for how to live above it, how to be at peace, how to have joy, how to have life in a world that is so often pulling you dragging you down, overwhelming you. And so if people are looking at you, what do you want them to see? What do you want them to believe about what life with God can be like when they see the way that you live? And the counterbalancing question, not what do you want them to see, but what are they seeing? Maybe we just broaden it up a little. What do you think? What, 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 do, you, what do you think the non-Christian world thinks when they observe Christians in general? Oh, that's what Christians are like. What do you think they are seeing? There's something that I desperately want them to see. Because the God of the universe, Son Jesus Christ, love sinners love them, are desperate for them to be reconciled back to God. And, and Jesus did everything he could when he lived here to demonstrate his love to the worst, worst people. I want to show them uh, people who very corrupt, even when we talked about Zacchaeus, very corrupt, evil, thieves, power hungry, the sexual, the people who were neck deep in sexual sins. And Jesus goes out of his way to extend the grace and compassion and love of God to them. Is that what they see when they see us? Do they know after interacting with us that God loves them? More times than not, I would think that they probably just think that they Christians in general, they're angry. They're angry at me. And if this is how God feels about it, he's angry at me too. He may even hate me. You seem to hate me. I think he might hate me. And there's some serious issues out there that Christians care about that we need to be advocating for. I'm not saying that these issues don't matter. And a lot of the things revolve around, it seems right now, around sexuality, the sanctity of life. 
compassion for people in hurting and desperate situations, rectifying long-term injustice that people have experienced. All of those issues matter, and they matter to God, and they should matter to you. And we should advocate for justice for people. We should advocate for the sanctity of life. And we should point out when it is appropriate that there are certain expressions of sexuality that are more harmful than good, even though you may be free to do it. And then we get really upset because these things, they kind, of, they kind of creep into our schools. And so then we get really upset about it that non-Christians want to raise their children with non-Christian values. And it's upsetting and I understand, I understand, I understand. And so some people say, I'm going to homeschool. I'm going to go to Christian school or whatever. We're going to do all these different things. Okay, okay, okay. But we don't have to burn the place down on the way out. We don't have to, we don't have to demonstrate or, or model to them that somehow, because you don't understand yet the goodness and grace of God and you don't understand yet the power of following him and his values, that somehow I've got to be angry about that. When Jesus saw sin, it broke his heart. When we see sin, it should break our hearts. It should make us desperate to point them even further to Jesus. And we will do it the way that Jesus did. With kindness, with grace and compassion. We will do it the way that Daniel did it. With kindness, with grace and compassion. We act sometimes like the only two options that we have are fighting people or compromise. And we see with Daniel, we see it all throughout the Gospels, a completely different idea. I don't have to compromise who I am. I don't have to change what I believe. I don't have to change the way that I live my life. I'm not going to compromise God's values because the world around me is pulling me a different direction. But I'm also not going to be angry at non-Christians for acting like non-Christians. I'm going to demonstrate to them the love and the compassion that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Daniel goes and prays, verse 13. And they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed, which is just... Doesn't paint this guy in a great light. He didn't think about it. Like what a, I mean, this guy's an idiot. It seems like he's an idiot. And, and we're gonna, and, it, and that's important because it's important because of what we're gonna see Daniel's gonna do to respond to it. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. I can imagine your Daniel right there in that situation. I hope God takes care of you. I wish my king wasn't an idiot. What is wrong with you? Why didn't you sign the law in the first place, dum-dum? Thanks for nothing. Like, like, what what was he feeling? Maybe I'm just projecting. Obviously, it's frustrating. It's certainly frightening at a minimum. So he gets put in there. Verse 19. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel shouted from the pit, Yeah, no thanks to you. No, listen to this. This is... Daniel answered, May the king live forever. What? What? His first response, his first words were to praised the king who had just put his life at risk and passed a law that was designed to make people not worship God and to worship himself. And the first thing out of his mouth is a compliment and a praise to this king. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. 
nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. So Daniel's not angry. He doesn't rage. He just humbly and graciously lives a godly life. And then suddenly he gets to watch God do amazing things. He gets to see God do amazing things. That's what happens. This is what he gets to see. He gets to see God show up in a big way because he was humble. He didn't, he wasn't fighting for some illusion of control in his own life. He was submitting himself to God, the God who was in control, and he got to see God do something amazing. And I have to say here, in this one, God's person versus the lions, God's person won, the lions lost. But you fast forward a little bit in history, first couple of centuries after Jesus' death, there were a lot of Christians being thrown to lions because of the same exact scenario, choosing to worship God in a way that the Roman Empire deemed to be inappropriate. And in most, if not all of those situations, the lions won. And you know what God did there? He used their humility and the peace and the joy and the devotion that they had in addition to the fact that they were known as a people of great compassion and lover of the lowliest people in that society. And he used these moments with those lines to break the Roman Empire and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world. So whether the lion wins or not, it doesn't matter. God wins every time and shows up and does amazing things in those moments and in the big picture. And if we want to see God show up and do these amazing things, it is going to be because we with humble, with humility, with grace and compassion for people, live the lives that God has called us to. And with gentleness and grace and kindness, both with our words and with our lives, point the people who are desperate for him, who need him so much, humbly point them to Jesus. I'm not I'm trying to draw a lot of attention to me. I'm not trying to fight. I'm not trying to be angry. I'm not trying to be hostile. I'm trying to bring hope and life to people who are desperate for it. Let me pray. God, again, I thank you for Daniel. The humility that he showed. That God, I, I just, I just, I'm blown away by it. And it really is, God, it's just a precursor of what your son Jesus did a few hundred years later. Of just humbly loving, sacrificing. And God, you showed up. God, I ask you to show up in our lives. The God, that we would have the courage to not compromise and the humility and the trust to not get angry, to not fight, to not try to make something happen for ourselves, but to fully trust you. That we would reject this binary of anger or compromise. And that we would follow the model of Daniel follow the model of your son that we would humbly live for you humbly advocate for you and with grace and compassion point a broken world to your son Jesus Christ and it's in his name that we pray amen